Today on Door of Hope, Mark Howard presents Science in the Light of the Scriptures. You know, there is hope in our secular world, and that hope is the light of the gospel. And I want to share today on this topic, bringing clarity to the gospel, dispelling the fog of compromise. So I want to look at some attempts that people have made over the years to try and fit the assumed millions of years of evolutionary history into the Bible. I call these compromise theories. Now, this is a somewhat delicate topic. I'm well aware that a lot of people have been taught some of these theories over the years, and they may have settled the issue of science and faith in their minds, but may not be fully aware of the implications of what they have chosen to believe. So please bear with me today if I ruffle some feathers. I spoke at a church and after the morning service, the pastor threw the session open to questions. As usual, there were a variety of questions and then a gentleman stood up and he started to challenge me over a number of things that I had said in the talk and it became very apparent that he was definitely not on the page of Genesis being history. Afterwards, he sent an email to all of the people in the church. Turned out he was the lead elder. One of our supporters received that email and he sent it to me. I wrote a rebuttal of all the things that this gentleman had written about me and what I'd said. And uh, our supporter then sent that to the congregation. It very quickly became quite a public discussion. The pastor, of course, became very involved, quite concerned about what was happening in his congregation. But in the course of the interchange, the question was asked, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And this gentleman said, no. Friends, that revealed that he was actually a wolf in sheep's clothing. He was not born again. And here he was, the lead elder. We gave a big problem for that pastor. You know, in The Art of War by Sun Zhu, A key strategy is to know your enemy. And in Genesis chapter 3, we discover the enemy's tactics. He came into the garden in the form of the serpent and he said to Eve, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now notice what he does. First of all, he plants the seed of doubt. But then he questions God's goodness. You see, God had only forbidden the fruit of one tree in the garden. Not all of them. And then he took the next step and he outright lied. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. You know, the enemy's tactics are the same today. He casts doubt. He challenges or questions God's goodness. And then he lies outright. So did God really say that he created in six days. Did God really say that creation was very good? Did God really say that the earth is only thousands of years old in the chronogenealogies in Genesis? Did God really say Adam's sin brought death and suffering into the world? Now, there are a whole range of theories, compromise theories, that attempt to bring the millions of years into the Bible. And they all challenge each of those points that I've just made. And we see here the gap theory, the day-age theory, progressive creation, theistic evolution, the framework hypothesis, and more recently, the lost worlds of Genesis. Now, these are all attempts to put the millions of years into the Bible. So they are like a fog that obscures the light of the gospel. Some people have been taught these theories over the years, and by the way, they are taught in Bible colleges throughout the Western world. Every single one of them you'll find taught somewhere. But friends, the Holy Spirit leads us into truth. I'm sure you know what I mean, that when you hear someone preach a message that is honouring of God and is consistent with his word. It, it, it lifts your spirits and your heart and it encourages you in your faith. I remember a lady said to me as she left a meeting, oh, she said, my heart sings because her faith had been encouraged and uplifted. 
But there are others who steadfastly refuse to accept the truth and they continue to propagate false teaching. Why? You know, Paul alerted the church at Corinth to what he called angels of light. And they were bringing false teaching into the church. They presented themselves as gospel workers and preachers, teachers and so on. And Paul writes, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Wow. Satan's servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Such people, you see, are actually dupes of Satan. And they are, though, in reality, (laughs) wolves in sheep's clothing. But they can be very hard to spot because they look like angels of light. They're, They're such nice people. So how do we spot a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, I suspect that they will do what Satan does. And what's that? Well, first of all, they will oppose God's word, just like that gentleman did at the meeting that I mentioned a little while ago. They will teach contrary to God's word, that, for instance, death was in the world before sin. They will question the goodness of God. They will say death is the agency of creation, that God made the world full of suffering, death and misery. They will deny God the worship that is due to him. Instead of ascribing to God worship for his amazing creation, they'll say things like, isn't it incredible what evolution has done over millions and millions of years? They hinder the effective proclamation of the gospel. They do that by removing the whole idea of God as creator. Nature just made itself. They will take away the sense of God's sovereignty, that he alone is the judge and that every single one of us will be called to account one day. And they will foment division within the church. It's often said that our ministry is a divisive ministry. And I guess in a sense that's true. But Jesus himself said, I come to bring a sword and divide people in families. So why did Jesus say that? You see, Jesus brought truth and the Bible is his word and it is truth. So people who reject the truth, they are actually the divisive ones. You see, unity comes only when people gather around truth. So what's happened over the years is that the scientist has come with all his assumed evidence that proves the millions and millions of years like the record in the geology, the geological uh, column and the fossil record. And for the last couple of centuries, by and large, the theologian has said, wow, this is all proven fact. What can I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'll just have to add it to the Bible. This has been a tragic compromise. Now, remember that the evolutionary story begins with the assumption there is no God. Do you know the Bible identifies people who say there is no God? Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, the first verse begins. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So when someone embraces the evolutionary story, which begins with the assumption there is no God, in God's eyes, they are fools. (laughs) Why would we as Christians entertain the ramblings of fools? And yet we do. Sadly, many Christians today feel intimidated by the secularists, failing to recognise that we stand on the rock-solid basis of the Word of God, which, in fact, theology has been described as the queen of sciences. This is where we find truth, and it's the Bible's record of history that illuminates the world around us and therefore points us to the Creator God. So our hope and prayer is that through this series of talks, you will have your faith renewed and you'll be encouraged to have confidence in the Bible and that you will be equipped to defend your faith. And of course, that you will know where to go to get resources to do that. So let's take a look at some of these compromise theories. 
And the first one that I want to address is what we could call theistic evolution. Now, it kind of is an umbrella, if you like, for the others, which more or less fit under this category uh, with, with some qualification. But theistic evolution is what I used to believe must have been the case as a young man, as I described earlier. And remember, I showed the gospel message in block form. Now, I'm an engineer, so I think structurally. And we pointed out that the foundation stones are what we find in the book of Genesis, the creation account and the fall of man, the rebellion of Adam. Now, if evolution is true, then Genesis is not. And if Genesis is not true, the gospel is without foundation. And so it becomes this abstract philosophical religious construct that sort of floats out there in metaphysical land. It becomes disconnected from the real world. Some argue that Genesis allows for any scientific theory of origins because it simply doesn't interest itself with the real physical events, but rather the nature of the creator, the value of creation and man's place in it. But friends, without the foundation in actual history, things which took place in the space-time universe, the gospel is at best incomplete and essentially illogical. And it doesn't answer those basic questions that we considered in an earlier, uh, earlier session. Now, as a young man, I attempted to accommodate evolution into my understanding of the gospel by replacing that foundation stone with the assumption that God used evolution to create what we could call theistic evolution. But if you think about it, theistic evolution is really an oxymoron because why would God choose a method to create that doesn't require him? I guess I hadn't really thought that through at the time. But there's a problem, isn't there? You see, if theistic evolution is true, then and God used suffering and death to create over millions and millions of years, then the creation was not very good. And if the creation was not very good, what does that say about man's rebellion? It could have had no physical consequence because death and suffering were already in the world. So what we have then is what you could call a fall-less gospel. You see, evolution negates the fall. If evolution's true, the fall can't be. But the fall negates evolution. If the fall is true, evolution can't be. So what does this fallless gospel mean for Jesus' sacrifice for us? The classic question we addressed in an earlier session, why did Jesus die? You see, death and suffering now cannot be the result of sin if God used evolution to create. Now, some suggest that Adam's sin didn't bring physical death, but just a spiritual death. But how can that be? Because when God gave the curse, he said, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. If Adam was already subject to physical death, he would have just thought to himself, well, so what? <laughs> I'm going to die anyway. Of course, he didn't die immediately. And some people say, ah, you see, the Bible's wrong because it said, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. But you see, two things happened. Firstly, Adam was separated in relationship from God, spiritual death, if you like. That was immediate. They went and hid themselves. But the inevitable processes of decay began, and Adam died 930 years later. Think of it like this. You could cut a branch off a tree and for the first day, it's going to look fine, isn't it? The leaves are still healthy, but inevitably it will wither and die. Adam cut himself off from the source of all life. The only possible outcome was death. But did Adam's rebellion affect only humans? Maybe animals were always going to be subject to death. Well, the Bible doesn't say anywhere Adam's sin brought death to animals, but there are a number of scriptures that point very clearly that the whole of the animal kingdom was cursed. And let me share a couple with you. 
Right at the beginning, God made man and all the animals to be vegetarian. There was no bloodshed, no carnivory. That came after the fall. And permission to eat meat was given to Noah after the flood. God declared the creation to be very good, which implies there was no brutality and bloodshed going on in the animal kingdom. God provided animal skins for Adam and Eve as a covering of their sin. You know, that's the first recorded animal death in the Bible. God cursed the serpent above all the other animals, which means that they were not already cursed up until that point. When the Bible talks about death, it uses this phrase nefesh chaya, which means animals with the breath of life in them, which, for instance, would exclude insects. So if Adam stepped on an ant, for instance, that's not death in the biblical sense. We read in Leviticus that the life is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, it says in Hebrew. So the blood is very important. Life is important. All creation is in bondage to decay, and we see that universally throughout the creation. And that is a consequence of sin. And death is described as the last enemy. Hardly likely that God would use an enemy as the agency of creation. But imagine what it would be like if animal death was around before Adam's sin. So here we have Adam in the garden, all this horrific, ghastly, bloodthirsty stuff going on around him. Uh, I can imagine a conversation God says to Adam, Adam, nature is bad for you, but if you obey me, I will save you from nature. <laughs> it's bizarre, isn't it? No, Adam's sin brought suffering and death into the whole of the creation, including of animals. Here we see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and God declares it all to be very good. But if evolution was true, then underneath their feet would have been layers and layers of rock showing fossils, now obviously very dead, revealing disease, cancers, tumours, uh, carnivory, all manner of horrific suffering. That's not consistent with God's declaration of a very good creation. Now, there are some organisations that champion theistic evolution. One such organisation is BioLogos, founded by Francis Collins, a very famous scientist, uh, a geneticist and physician. And uh, he's a very nice man. Let's have a look at their mission. It says, BioLogos invites the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith as we present an evolutionary understanding of God's creation. So that reveals their perspective. They're coming from evolution as a given to reveal an understanding in that context of God's creation. And their core commitments. We embrace the historical Christian faith, upholding the authority and inspiration of the Bible. Amen. Excellent. We affirm evolutionary creation. But wait a minute. There's nothing in the Bible that supports evolutionary creation. I'll go on. Recognising God as creator of all life over billions of years. But there's no mention of billions of years in God's word, the Bible. Not from cover to cover. And, you know, it will be so easy for the Hebrew to say so. It's quite within the capacity of the Hebrew to say there, I created the world in as many years as there are grains of sand on the seashore. That would do. But nothing not a hint. And lastly, we seek truth, ever learning as we study the natural world and the Bible. Notice they're studying the natural world and then the Bible. I would suggest the other way around is a much better strategy. Now, on the BioLogos website, a gentleman called Kenton Sparks published an article which contained this statement. Now, if we think about it, Remember, Jesus believed that Genesis was true. Remember, we discussed that in a previous session. We talked about how Jesus referred to the blood of righteous Abel, Adam and Eve's son. He talked about Noah. He talked about places that were mentioned in the book of Genesis. He regarded it, as do the other New Testament writers, as actual history. So Kenton Sparks, who 
believes the evolutionary story, writes this. If Jesus, as a finite human being, erred from time to time, hmm, there is no reason at all to suppose that Moses, Paul, John wrote scripture without error. Rather, we are wise to assume that the biblical authors expressed themselves as human beings writing from the perspectives of their own finite, broken horizons. Wow. He has just accused the Son of God of error. But Jesus said, I only say what I hear my father say. I only do what I see my father doing. So if Jesus was wrong, that means God the Father was wrong too. And the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles' words to become part of the canon and scripture and encapsulated those errors. So Kenton Sparks has just impugned all three persons of the Godhead. But he's such a nice man. So let's look at the next of these compromise theories. This one, the gap theory, very popular, well known, and it was first established in the early 1800s by a theologian, Thomas Chalmers. He accepted what he thought was the indisputable fact of the millions of years from geology. Sadly, he did not stand on the word of God and reject what he was being told. He sought, probably with good intent, to harmonise. Now, there's a chapter in our Answers book, chapter three, that deals with the gap theory because it's such a common one. And I do commend the Answers book to you. You'll find copies of this at the resource tables at the back of the hall. So the gap theory proposes that between Genesis verse 1 and chapter 1 verse 2, there is a gap. And in that gap is where we plug all the millions and billions of years. And the story goes that there was a pre-Adamic race and Satan rebels in heaven. He's cast down to the earth. Um, causes a great disruption. There's a Luciferian flood which lays down all the rock layers and produces the fossil record. And then God recreates the world in six days. It also requires that the flood of Noah is a tranquil event that leaves no evidence. But there's a problem, a lot of problems actually. The Hebrew grammar does not allow for any gaps in Genesis chapter 1. You see, verse 2 begins with what's called the Vav disjunctive. It's kind of parenthetical, if you will, and it, it's describing the current situation of things. And it's best translated as, now the earth was formless and void, or empty. Verse 3 begins with the Vav consecutive, which implies a time sequence and is best translated as, and or then, which most translations do, and the commencement of all the other creation days begins with a Vav consecutive. The grammar in Genesis chapter 1 is tight. There are no gaps that are possible. The gap theory also goes on and depends on translating verse 2 as the earth became formless and void. But you know, that same Hebrew construction is used many, many times elsewhere. It's never translated as became. For example, in Genesis 13, verse 2, it speaks of Abraham leaving Egypt, and it says Abraham was very rich. It doesn't mean that on leaving Egypt, Abraham became very rich. And the gap theory claims support from Jeremiah 4.23 in the use of the words tohu and bohu, meaning formless and void. And it says that these words are used in the context of judgment. In Jeremiah, it is an illusion to Genesis because the judgment would be so severe that the final state would be empty, like the initial creation on day one, as the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. But it doesn't necessarily mean a judgmental thing or a destruction. For instance, I could uh, open a Word document on my laptop and before I start to type, it's empty because I haven't filled it yet. Alternatively, I could open an existing Word document and then delete the contents. So it's become empty through an act of destruction. But empty in itself 
can equally mean simply unfilled, which is, of course, the context in Genesis. You'll find lots of resources and uh, more materials on the gap theory on our website. Let's take a look at this day-age theory. Now, this is a, a classic one, very uh, common, very popular. You'll find in chapter two of the Answers book an extensive treatment of the day-age idea. And it comes from a scripture in 2 Peter that says, With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So people say, well, you could say the days of Genesis were thousands of years. But this particular passage of scripture relates to the second coming. It's got nothing to do with creation. And by the way, it's a simile. It's saying it is like, not that it is, and note that it goes both ways. It expands time and it contracts time. A thousand years is like a day. So which way should you apply it? For instance, if you applied it as contracting time, then the six days of creation would reduce to about a quarter of a second, which doesn't really help the cause, does it? Now, it's true that the word day can have multiple meanings. And I've contrived this little sentence here to illustrate. In my father's day. Well, of course, that means an indefinite period of time in the past. Not that my father only lived for 24 hours. If that was true, I wouldn't be here, would I? It took 10 days. Do you know, if you put a number next to the word day, it always means a 24-hour day. You can check it out in any language you like. And, of course, day can mean the daylight hours of the day. The Bible makes it very clear, though, in Exodus 20, verse 11, what God means. And this is in the fourth commandment. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Now that makes no sense unless the days are days. Is God saying, I want you to work for 6,000 years and then rest for 1,000 years? No, of course not. And bear in mind, the finger of God wrote those words on the tablets of stone. No human intermediary there. So let's take a look now at the framework hypothesis. Now, the framework hypothesis is very popular in Bible colleges. It's um, quite interesting, intriguing, academic, and therefore appealing. Chapter two of the Answers book, once again, deals with the framework hypothesis, and you can find more information about it there. So the framework hypothesis is the idea that Genesis provides a framework for understanding the greater narrative of the Bible. But it's not meant to be a literal account of what actually happened. You could liken it, if you will, to a, a clothes line with clothes hanging. Now, the clothes are what's important, not the clothes line. The line is just a framework. And they claim to maintain biblical authority whilst rejecting the six days of creation week. It's a bit curious that how can you maintain biblical authority and at the same time reject what the Bible says? But anyway, let's set that aside. So the framework hypothesis claims a number of things, one of which is that the literary genre of the text is not history but poetry. The implication being, because it's poetry, it therefore isn't necessarily true. Let me quote the words of Meredith Klein, who was one of the proponents of this hypothesis. He said, To rebut the literalist interpretation of the Genesis creation week propounded by the young earth theorists. That was the objective behind his developing the framework hypothesis. And his colleague, Henri Blocher, says, The rejection of all the theories accepted by scientists requires considerable brav bravado. So in effect, he has capitulated to the scientific community. He's been intimidated by it. Now, I guess in a sense it requires some bravado, but not if you understand what science is capable of doing and what it is not capable of doing. Remember that earlier session where we talked about science in the light of the scriptures and I discussed the limitations of science. So, well, let's have a look at the the literary genre of Genesis. Uh, is it poetry or is it narrative? A very interesting analysis was done, which took 97 Hebrew texts, 48 narrative texts and 49 poetic ones. And they looked at the ratios of past tense verbs 
to other verbs in the text. Now, in poetry, the ratio is very low, about 4%. And if you think about it, poems like to bring the reader into the scene. So there's an extensive use of present and future tenses and so on, not so much past tense. But historical passages use past tense verbs a lot more. In fact, the median here is 52%. For instance, if we're describing something that we did, we would say, we went there, or we did this. We speak in past tense in describing an historical event. So where does Genesis chapter 1 fit? Here it is, firmly in the narrative court. In fact, statistically, it shows there's a 99.99% probability that Genesis 1 is narrative. Now, there is actually one verse of poetry in Genesis chapter 1, and it's verse 27. I've shown it here in italics. How do I know it's poetry? Well, Hebrew poetry has a number of telltale devices, indicators, if you will. One of them is a device called a chiasmus. It's this X shape. So you have A, then B, then B, then A. And I've shown with the colours there that structure. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Classic chiasmus. So it's like God reaches this point in the narrative of creation and he breaks into poetry to describe the pinnacle of his creative effort. Mankind made in the image of God. The rest of Genesis 1 is prose. Magnificent prose, yes, but prose nonetheless. The framework hypothesis also suggests that Genesis is actually a polemic against the surrounding cultures. And for instance, it suggests that the Gilgamesh epic, which is a Babylonian flood myth, was refuted by the story of Noah. So the Gilgamesh epic comes first, and the account of Noah is a story made to refute this um, Gilgamesh epic. Well, let's check it out. Is Noah's flood account based on the Gilgamesh epic, or is it based on fact? Well, the first thing we discover is the Gilgamesh epic tells of a great flood, which lasted seven days, by the way, and the hero, Utnapishtim, survives in a cubic arc. Well, let's think about that. Can you imagine a cubic arc tossed on stormy seas? How stable would such a thing be? I mean, it would just tumble hopelessly, wouldn't it? You see, that's clearly not seaworthy. So this is not a true historical account. It also tells us that the gods are terrified by the rising floodwaters and they're starving because of lack of offerings being made by the humans. This is a very weak form of polytheism, which can be shown through archaeological evidence to be a later degenerate form of, uh, of monotheism. And thirdly, people groups all around the world have flood legends. But that's consistent with what you'd expect after the Tower of Babel. You see, at the Tower of Babel, which came after the flood, Noah was still alive. Every single person that fled from the Tower of Babel as God confused the languages knew the truth. And those people groups took the truth with them. Some recorded it in writing, so it was preserved well, others verbally. In fact, many of the Australian Aboriginal people groups have flood stories. I had the privilege of going into Gumbalanya in Arnhem Land and our Christian Aboriginal friend who was taking us pointed out on the top of a ridge we drove past this feature that, that Europeans often called the piano lid. And he said, they are the remains of the paper bark raft that saved the surviving family from the great flood that destroyed the whole earth. So we make legends out of history. We don't make history from legends. So it's far more logical that the Gilgamesh epic is actually just a corrupted version of Genesis. You can find a lot of material on creation.com, excellent articles on the framework hypothesis. Let's take a look now at progressive creation. 
We have a book called Refuting Compromise that is available from our website. And the whole book is dedicated to refuting the writings of this gentleman, Hugh Ross, and his ministry, Reasons to Believe. Progressive creation seeks to accommodate the billions of years of evolution into the biblical text, just like all the others do. It claims that the days of creation were vast ages and that the seventh day is still continuing. It says animal death and carnivory precede man and that Adam was a hominid who just received a soul. And we've looked uh, and refuted those claims. It says God created the various creatures in separate acts of creation, hence the name progressive creation, to try and match the appearance of creatures in the fossil record. And it claims that Noah's flood was local. So let's just touch on a couple of those for the moment. The seventh day. Now, the idea here is that the expression there was evening and there was morning does not apply to the seventh day. So Hugh Ross argues that the seventh day hasn't ended. Therefore, if it is of indefinite length, then maybe so with the other six. He argues, too, that in Hebrews 4, it means that God is still resting, so the seventh day is still continuing. But God's present rest doesn't logically imply a long seventh day. What it means is that the believer's rest is eternal. We rest from our own efforts and rely totally on the finished work of Christ on the cross for our salvation. God's rest on the seventh day, by the way, is always referred to in the past tense. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, we read, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. It doesn't say God is resting on the seventh day. And in Exodus 20, that we saw earlier from the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, it only makes sense if the days are all normal earth rotation days. And the whole idea here contradicts the plain meaning of scripture, as in the meaning of the word yom and so on. But what about the flood? Was it local or was it global? But what does the Bible say? The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. So how could you cover all the high mountains over the entire earth with a local flood? Unless perhaps it was it was like this. But that's obviously bizarre. I mean, if it was local, why didn't Noah and his family simply migrate to another country? Why did they take birds on the ark, for heaven's sake? And importantly, God must have broken his promise to never again send another flood if the flood was just a local flood. You see, it makes no sense whatsoever. By the way, we're often challenged, where did all the water go after the flood? Ah, one of those gotcha type questions. Well, interestingly, with the aid of Google Earth, you can zoom back over the Pacific, Pacific Ocean and here you can see in the bottom left just the east coast of Australia and up in the top right, just a little glimpse of the west coast of the US. There's a lot of water out there, isn't there? Do you know if you raise the ocean bases and lowered the continents so that the Earth was a perfect sphere, the water of the oceans would cover the Earth to a depth of almost 3,000 metres. That's a lot of water. So let's take a look now at this more recent idea, which has been put forward by a gentleman called John Walton. And he published a series of books called The Lost World Series. He has The Lost World of Genesis 1, The Lost World of Scripture, the lost world of Adam and Eve, the lost world of the flood, and the lost world of the Torah. Now, Walton argues that the traditional understanding of the Bible is mistaken. And in order to understand the Bible, we need to appreciate how to understand ancient Near East literature to interpret the Bible correctly. And only now can we really understand Genesis. So apparently for thousands of years, the early church fathers, all Christians, have all been wrong and mistaken. Aren't we fortunate that we now have John Walton? In his book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, he claims that the ancient Near East literature is concerned with 
functional and not material origins. In other words, what was it for? Not that it was physically made. However, Genesis is actually concerned with both. And if you think about it, on day three, God creates the dry land for the vegetation and plants. On day four, he creates the sun, moon and stars to serve as signs for seasons and to measure time, days, months, years. He then says that God inhabits this cosmic temple as revealed in seven days. The material creation precedes Genesis chapter one, so allowing for the evolutionary story and its millions of years, which of course places death and suffering before sin. In summary, Walton places his interpretation of the ancient Near East literature in authority over the scriptures. In his book, The Lost World of Adam and Eve, he argues that Adam and Eve were part of a larger group of hominins. And we talked about the likelihood of that earlier on and the unreal scenario of being surrounded by death and suffering in the animal world. He argues that Eve was not taken from Adam's side in spite of the clear description in the book of Genesis. And he rejects Jesus' understanding of the history of the world when Jesus said at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, quoting from Genesis 1 and 2. And of course, he rejects the genealogies in Genesis and in Luke chapter 3, which traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam, the son of God. The Lost World of Adam and Eve is a work that is subtle but full frontal attack on the authority and inerrancy of the scriptures. As such, it must be rejected as a dangerous work of false teaching. And then in his book, The Lost World of the Flood, Walton proposes, it was co-authored, by the way, with Tremper Longman III, and uh, they argue for a local flood, although they do acknowledge that the Bible says it was global. And we've talked about the ridiculousness of the local flood idea. He actually claims there's absolutely no geological evidence for a global flood. I think he needs to see the previous session that we had on that. And he rejects the possibility of such a large vessel as the ark. The authors of The Lost World of the Flood play fast and loose with biblical authority and inerrancy. In summary, the end result of Walton's teaching is to place in the mouth of Christ and the word of his heavenly father, falsehood and error. This is tantamount to blasphemy and should be rejected by discerning readers. Walton's Lost World series should therefore be exposed as the dangerous works of false teaching that they are. Friends, all of these compromise theories are actually fatally flawed. And the flaw is that they all place death before Adam's sin. And that totally undercuts the very reason that Jesus went to the cross. In Galatians, Paul says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. And he goes on in the next verse, as we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned, twice cursed for false teaching. You see, God's word is our only source of truth, but it is lack of belief that obscures the truth. Mixing error in there confuses what the Bible says. So did God really say he created in six days? Yes, he did. Did God really say the creation was very good? Yes, it was. Did God really say the earth is only thousands of years old? Yes, it is. Did God really say Adam's sin brought death and suffering into the world? Yes, it did. Friends, make sure you are equipped with answers to the many questions that confront Christians today. Go to CMI's website at creation.com. Get hold of materials from our resources table at the back of the hall. You know, Jesus' disciples asked him once, what must we do to do the work God requires? And Jesus answered, this is the work of God, that you believe in him 
whom he has sent. Our task is to believe Jesus. These little creatures are bees. And the next time you see one of these little guys, be amazed. The bee is truly a gift from God. You see, if we did not have bees, we wouldn't have any fruit like this because the bees help to pollinate the flowers on fruit trees and on farms like this. In fact, a lot of crops that you see in uh, farming would not exist if the bee wasn't able to pollinate. And what would happen? The whole world would starve. Bees are very important because God created them. He created them for a reason. Do you know, bees can navigate their way around. They're able to find food and then get back to their beehive. That means they must have a God-given GPS. People researching bees tell us that they are very, very efficient in getting food from flowers and how they operate back in the beehive. You see, the bee gathers pollen or nectar and can carry its own weight in both of these. Well, the bee gets back to the hive and he passes on to the other bees the things that he's just collected. And what happens is the nectar changes into honey. Finally, the bees store the honey in these cells that you can see in this picture. And they cover it with wax. Before the bee goes back out to collect more nectar and pollen, it will clean itself. Very good. It takes 600 bees to get one kilo of honey. Do you know God created bees for a very specific purpose? To pollinate the plants and to collect that beautiful nectar so that it would be made into honey for us to enjoy as natural food. That's something to think about. Bees are really, really clever. There's verses in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 are very, very interesting because it says when we look around at creation such as these birds we've got pictured here, we can see the hand of God that God created. When you look at those many, many species of birds that we have here in Australia, our creator God, the same God of the Bible, has made each of these creatures in their own kind, just as it says in the book of Genesis. Each of these birds have an individual characteristic, and each of them, various shapes and sizes, are there for a reason. When you think of a small or even a large bird, the fact that it comes from a humble egg, and even more remarkable, how it actually lives inside that egg and then escapes from that egg. They hatch and become an awesome flying machine. Did you know that a bird has hollow bones? and struts inside honeycombed with air sacs to give them incredible strength. Take the humble bird feather. It is a remarkable achievement. It's hollow and not only allows the bird to fly, but also keeps it warm. God has created these creatures for us to enjoy, to see his creation and his handiwork. Have you ever noticed the way birds tuck their feet in behind their bodies to allow faster movement through the air? It's just like a huge aircraft taking off and retracting its undercarriage. In fact, early aviators studied birds in flight to see if one day man could fly. Even the aerodynamic shape of a bird and its wing design are very, very much similar to modern day aircraft, except maybe for the flapping wings. One bird that has captured my attention is the peregrine falcon capable of diving at 200 miles per hour. That is 322 kilometers an hour. And God has given it amazing eyesight to be able to look at things way off in the distance. It even has a see-through eyelid, an extra eyelid to allow clear vision. It also has dark eye patches under the eyes to stop glare. And to be able to breathe at that speed, God has given it baffles in its nose. Do you know, modern day jet engines are created in exactly the same way. I wonder which bird they copied that from. 
These birds are able to fly at huge speeds because of the way God has specifically created them. Then there is the mighty gliding albatross, far superior to any man-made glider made today. They are able to stay at sea for months and months, able to lock their wings so they can effortlessly glide for hours on end. And astoundingly, and this is really, really amazing, they're able to survive on seawater, just like other seabirds. They drink the salt water and then excrete the salt. The albatross was designed for flight by our creator who went into great detail for each of these bird species. Recently, scientists were talking about studies of birds, birds flying in formation, and they spoke about how birds managed to keep separated, even though there might be a hundred at a time in the air, keep separated from each other. And the scientists were saying if they were able to discover what this ability was, it would achieve huge safety results for aviation worldwide. But notice, God did it first. It's been like that for thousands and thousands of years. We're really studying the handiwork of the master designer, God our creator, the God of the Bible. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis chapter 1 that God made everything. In the beginning, God made every single thing Beautiful creatures called birds, and each after their own kind. In fact, God invented flight. In the early days of flight, people who wanted to build a flying machine watched birds and how they became airborne, and especially studied the shape of their wings that gave them lift. Well, God created it first. Then a man called Ivan Sikorsky, it is said, studied the humble dragonfly and watched how it could fly. Dragonflies are quite amazing. They can move in any direction. Suddenly, up and down, forward and back, left and right, they have four different styles of flight. The front wings can beat out of phase with the back wings, and this creates a huge amount of lift and speed. Dragonflies have a high power to weight ratio, important for flight and when performing sharp turns. They can accelerate at a gravity weight of between 4 and 9 Gs. They have small weights on the leading edge of their wings to strengthen the wings so it doesn't fold in flight. Their two compound eyes have hundreds and hundreds of small facets to enable them to almost have a 360 degree vision. And note the body shape. It is almost the same as the humble helicopter. In Genesis in the Bible, it's the very first chapter of the Bible, this is what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now he made the sun and the moon and the water and the land. And then God said, let the land produce vegetation. That's all the green stuff. Seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with the seed in it, according to their various kinds. And God said it was good. Now that was the third day of his creation. Now here is the big question. (laughs) 
What came first, the tree or the apple, the seed or the tree? Remember it said in Genesis that God said, let there be trees that have fruit with seed in it. And in three days' time, God was going to make all of the animals and Adam and Eve, first human beings, and they all needed food to eat. You have to have an apple. You have to have an apple tree before you have an apple. And inside the apple are amazing little seeds to grow more apples. But inside all seeds is something like a little machine with lots and lots of information. And it even has a store of energy so it can germinate, sending down roots into the soil so they can search for water and nutrients. And then it grows its own solar farm. That's its leaves. The power plant of a tree. Imagine all the instructions needed to build something amazing like that. It's called photosynthesis. Solar engineers have been trying to copy plants and they can't work it out. God made the trees and the fruit and the seeds. In Romans chapter 1 in the Bible, it says that when we look around at all of God's creation, all the things that God has made, we see his creation and we know that he exists. And he says that no one has an excuse to say that he isn't true. The God of the Bible is our creator God. And have you ever wondered how God protects our fruit? When you take the skin off an apple, it goes yucky and brown. And after a while, you can't even eat it. But apples, oranges, bananas, in fact, all fruit have a skin that protects the fruit on the tree. And while it sits waiting in the shop to buy. And also, while the fruit is growing on the tree. Think of the poor old fruit sitting out there on the tree through rain and heat and cold, waiting for the time to be picked and then off to the shop and eaten later. God is pretty amazing how he made all of these things for us. If you would like a copy, contact us on Door of Hope, Box 71, Yaguna, New South Wales, 2199, Australia. Or phone us on... 02-97-86-5011 or visit our website christianmedia.net.au